Um, I am Harriet Harvey Horn, uh, co-chair along with the amazing Taryn McGrew of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of the Climate Reality Project. On behalf of our chapter, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event, Sustainable Food by Default. We're just really pleased to bring this to you this evening. You know, as climate impacts mount, we're all becoming more conscious of how we can use our personal choices to make a difference. Um, given the emissions impact and resource intensity of animal agriculture, um, one very worthy focus is our dietary choices. So we're really pleased to be shining the light on this topic this evening, and we really thank all of you for joining us. I also want to quickly note that this event is being recorded and will be available on the Climate Reality Bay Area YouTube channel within the next week or so. So per custom, we will open with a land acknowledgement. With respect, we acknowledge the Ohlone, Miwok, Patwin, and other indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands we currently occupy in the greater San Francisco region. This land acknowledgement helps remind us of the historic and ongoing oppression of indigenous people, how the taking and occupying of indigenous lands and the exploitation of ind indigenous people and those lands is directly connected to the climate crisis and how building relationships with and following the leadership of indigenous people here and everywhere is crucial as we seek and build long-term solutions to the global, global climate crisis. So let's uh, uh, see a show of hands. Uh, anybody that is new, this is your first Climate Reality Bay Area event. I'm gonna put it on gallery view so we can, I can see. Oh, good, thank you. Asha and Caitlin. Thank and you, Joyce. Asha. And Joyce, thank you for speaking up, Joyce. We've got a couple of pages worth of people. Amanda, thank you for being here, Helena. Wonderful. Well, we really appreciate all of you joining us this evening. Um, and I would also like a show of hands of anybody that just recently completed the climate reality leadership training. I think we have a fair number of new chapter members that uh, we want to recognize as well. And I'm not seeing any hands, so. Okay, well, anyway, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, given that we have so many new faces, I definitely want to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about um, Climate Reality Project and our chapter. The Climate Reality Project is an international nonprofit organization founded and chaired by former U.S. Vice President and Nobel Laureate Al Gore. Mr. Gore founded the organization in 2006, shortly after the release of his award-winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. The organization's mission is to mobilize a global grassroots network of climate advocates. Today, climate reality spans 170 countries, now with over, over 40,000 trained climate reality leaders around the world who are personally trained by Mr. Gore to speak truth to power about the climate crisis and its solutions. The Climate Reality Bay Area chapter is one of over 130 nationwide chapters focused on tar taking urgent action to address the climate and climate justice crises at the local level. We have over 1,400 members across the greater San Francisco Bay Area region, making ours one of the largest chapters in the world. We actively promote climate action with efforts focused on pushing government at all levels to adopt policies that ensure a just transition to a safer, healthier, decarbonized future and on advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice to bring frontline communities to the forefront of climate action. Our members give motivational climate presentations, advocate for policy action, build alliances, promote climate justice, youth climate action, and business engagement, as well as engage on local government policy efforts with county-based squads. We regularly host events like this, as well as workshops and advocacy opportunities. We welcome you to join us if you are not already a member and follow us on social media. Uh, Carolyn, who is running our Zoom, Carolyn Gugamos is our, one of our events co-chairs. We thank her for running the Zoom this evening. Um, and I'm hoping Carolyn won't mind dropping our um, URL for our website into the chat. Uh, you can also find it easily by Googling Climate Reality Bay Area. So now without further ado, I'll turn the program over to our chapter treasurer and also a chapter member since shortly after she was trained as a climate reality leader in 2018. Leanne Emamoto to introduce our program and our speaker. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Leanne. I have the great pleasure of introducing Katie Cantrell, who is a good buddy of mine at this point. She's come and spoken for groups at my company as well, and we're trying to implement some of her ideas and into our own catering systems. So Katie is the director of corporate outreach for the Better Food Foundation and the founder of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. She trained with Al Gore to be a climate leader in Seattle in 2017. And for more than a decade, she's led workshops on the social and ecological hazards of industrial animal agriculture and consulted on food policy at universities, government agencies, and Fortune 500 companies. Mine. Her materials have been used as a resource for food justice advocates around the world. So thank you, Katie, for being with us, and we look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Leanne. And Wei Tai and Harriet and everyone for, for um, working to schedule this. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you all see that? Good. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so yes, uh, again, my name is Katie Cantrell. I'm the Director of Corporate Outreach for the Better Food Foundation. And tonight I'll be talking about how we can encourage sustainability by default. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll have a lot of time tonight for Q&A. Um, and yeah, so you can drop questions in the chat or afterwards you can raise your hand. As Dr. Jonathan Foley explained in National Geographic, when we think about threats to the environment, we tend to picture cars and smokestacks, not dinner. But the truth is our need for food poses one of the biggest dangers to the planet. And within the food system, there is one sector in particular that has an outsized impact, and that is animal agriculture. Globally, animal agriculture uses 77% of all the farmland, contributes 57% of all greenhouse gas emissions, but produces only 18% of the protein. So you can see it has a really disproportionately large footprint for the amount of protein that it actually produces. So the rest of that protein is produced by plants. Um, and as you can see here, plant-based protein on the right has an amazingly smaller carbon footprint than animal-based proteins on the left. So the three foods with the highest carbon footprint are beef, lamb, and cheese. Now, oftentimes we're encouraged to switch from beef to chicken for environmental reasons. And it is certainly true that poultry has a much lower footprint than beef does, but poultry still has 11 times, the carbon footprint of poultry is still 11 times greater than that of lentils and peas and beans. So tonight we'll be talking about how we can shift our food choices from these very environmentally intensive products towards these more low footprint foods. Now, when we think about our carbon footprint and our consumption, we tend to think about what's visible above the waterline in this little uh, iceberg infographic slash metaphor here. So that's our individual food and water consumption, our individual food waste, also things like you know, our individual energy usage, how much we're driving, we don't really think about or see what's below the waterline. And in the case of animal agriculture, that's you know, everything from what the animals are eating, the soy and corn that they're fed, to the manure that they're producing, the greenhouse gases, the resulting river and ocean pollution. I mean, I could go on and on. So um, I'll just give a brief overview tonight of the negative impacts of animal agriculture and focus primarily on solutions and different ways that we as individuals and also as members of institutions can help solve all of these problems. But we still need to think about what is hidden from us below this waterline in order to understand the enormity of the problem and why food choices are such a potent solution. So one of the issues that we don't see is land use. Um, animal agriculture is incredibly in land intensive. You can see in this great infographic from Bloomberg um, on land use in the United States that cow pasture and rangeland is the single largest use of land in the US. It's a big yellow square in the middle. And this encompasses much more than just pasture land or um, prairie that would naturally have ruminants grazing on it. So this is really devastating ecologically. It's um, contributed to a lot of deforestation historically in the United States um, and to a lot of animals becoming endangered when their habitats are overgrazed. Now on the right, you can see in comparison, um, this little rectangle here shows all the food that we eat. Um, and you can see it's less than half of the size of the amount of land for all of the food 
that livestock are eating. So um, most of the farmland in the US is actually going to produce corn and soy that are fed to animals on factory farms. And just a fraction of that land is going to grow all of the rest, all of the you know, wheat and veggies and nuts and beans and legumes, everything else, all the fruit um, that the people in the United States are eating. Now this land use is a huge problem globally as well. So meat production is actually the leading cause of the Amazon rainforest being cut down to make grazing land for cattle and also to grow corn and soy that are fed to animals on factory farms. So oftentimes people hear that the rainforest is being cut down to plant soy and they think, oh, that's the fault of those you know, vegans who are drinking soy milk, but actually that soy is being used as feed crops to feed to animals that are being raised for meat. Animal agriculture also uses a disproportionately large amount of water. So this infographic from the New York Times shows the uh, footprints of different types of milk. So the top one is cow milk, and below that are all the different types of plant-based milks, some of the different types of plant-based milks, I should say. And so this, it ranks them according to emissions, land use, and water use. And you can see that by all measures, the cow milk is by far the most environmentally intensive. What surprises a lot of people is almond milk. Um, on the bottom right, you can see the water footprint of almond milk is still actually quite a bit smaller than the water footprint of cow milk. So especially in California during the drought, almonds got a bad rap as being very water intensive, which they are relative to other crops, but it is still less water intensive than cow milk and then animal products. So even switching from cow milk to almond milk, you're still saving water. But if you really wanna do the best you possibly can, um, oat milk is probably the most sustainable overall. And actually by switching from a gallon of cow milk to a gallon of soy or oat milk, you can save as much water as you can by not showering for an entire month. And the same is true of a, switching from a hamburger to a veggie burger. Just switching that one single burger, you save as much water as you would by not showering. So even though when we think about our water footprint, much like our carbon footprint, we tend to think of our direct usage Actually, the food that we're consuming is by far the largest contributor to our daily water footprint. And then to make matters even worse, um, factory farms, all the animals that they're producing, um, the manure from them is a leading cause of water pollution in the United States. And in California, this is especially true in the Central Valley. So the, it's disproportionately low income communities of color that bear the brunt of the pollution from animal agriculture. And then of course, um, you know, the reason we're all here tonight, animal agriculture is also a leading contributor of climate change. And in fact, taken together, the world's top five meat and dairy corporations are now responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than ExxonMobil, Shell, or BP. This is really shocking to a lot of people. When we talk about climate change, as discussed in that first quote, we usually think of fossil fuels, but in fact, food plays a large role. But part of the reason that we don't think so much about meat is because Big meat, like big oil, spends millions of dollars spreading disinformation. So they're stopping legislation on climate change. They are funding blog posts and op-eds saying that meat is not a, a climate problem. Actually, it's a climate solution. And generally just kind of confusing the public and keeping us in the dark about the fact that animal agriculture is a leading cause of climate change. And actually, um, there's some great investigative reporting that came out earlier this year that found that big meat actually spends a larger percentage of their revenue um, on climate disinformation than big oil does. Um, this is a kind of breaking news that's been happening with COP26. Um, now there's suddenly a lot of news articles about methane, um, which is a greenhouse gas that in the short term is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And animal agriculture is responsible for about 40% of all methane emissions, um, both globally, and that, that um, figure is pretty similar in the US as well. It's about 36% um, of all methane emissions in the US. So this is getting attention in the news right now because at COP26, that's been one of the main focuses now, um, or areas at least of accord, where um, governments are coming together and pledging to cut methane emissions by 30% uh, by 2030. And this is really critical because methane is a short acting greenhouse gas, and it's very potent in the short term, cutting methane can really help um, bring temperatures down quickly, as opposed to CO2, which acts on the longer term. So by cutting methane, we can kind of buy ourselves a little bit more time and implement some of these longer term solutions. So, you know, it's great that methane is being talked about, 
um, and companies are making these pledges. But unfortunately, what's just happened in the last couple of days, um, pretty unsurprisingly for those of us who follow this type of thing, but um, Tom Vilsack, the agriculture secretary, has come out and said that the main way that they'll fight methane emissions from agriculture is by offering incentives um, largely for methane digesters. And so these um, capture the methane that's emitted by these animals um, in factory farms being raised for meat and convert it into energy. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a mitigation technique. It, it is better than that methane just going straight into the atmosphere. Um, but there's a few different problems with this. And I know this is a little bit wonky, but because it's such a current event and it's an issue that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, I wanted to go into it just briefly. Um, so, I mean, part of the issue is that these digesters are very expensive and they're being paid for by taxpayers. So California has already um, shelled out over $100 million in taxpayer money paying for digesters. And now there's potentially billions of dollars in taxpayer money on the line um, with the federal incentives that will be offered. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I have a real problem with my taxpayer money subsidizing um, factory farms to clean up their pollution. You know, this for years has been an externalized cost. Um, meat is artificially cheap because taxpayers foot the bill for all the pollution. And this is just continuing that. Um, we are continuing to have to pay to clean up their mess while they get to reap the profits. And it's also a big issue because um, those methane digesters actually emit other types of air pollutants that, again, disproportionately harm communities of color. So they are not really a, a clean or green solution. And the final issue with this is that in California um, and you know, potentially other places that have um, a carbon market, now actually methane is becoming more profitable than the dairy or the meat um, because they're able to claim carbon credits for that methane that they're recapturing. And so this is really effectively subsidizing the factory farming industry. And then they are investing that profit into further expanding factory farms. So I think that this is actually kind of the new main front of the war against factory farming is um, the subsidies and carbon credits from methane. Um, essentially now, you know, some people are even going so far as to say like, these are basically methane factories with dairy as a byproduct of it um, because we're financially incentivizing this methane production. So, um, a little, you know, a little bit of a tangent, but you know, since we're all interested in climate and this is brand new, I wanted to talk about it a bit. And then, you know, a lot of people ask, well, what about grass-fed beef and regenerative beef? Um, there's a lot of talk about that being a carbon sink. Um, and, you know, certainly it is better in a lot of ways than factory farming um, when you're intensively raising huge amounts of animals in very small spaces. Um, but the leading scientific studies have found that grass-fed livestock are not a climate solution. Um, even the best managed rotational grazing systems are still net emitters of carbon. So grazing livestock are really not a solution to, to, the, to the problem. Um, they're uh, contributors to climate problem as are all livestock. And the other issue with this is that um, there's, you know, people say, well, let's just get rid of factory farming and raise all animals on pasture. But the average American currently eats about three hamburgers per week. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> My dog is getting back from a walk and she's very excited. So it might be a little bit noisy. <laughs> um, so um, there was a recent study that came out that found that um, if we raised all cattle on pasture, we could only support about 30% of the current amount of beef consumption um, <laughs> with, um, with the existing rangeland. Um, um, so, you know, if we wanted to actually raise all animals on pasture, then we would have to deforest the remaining land, just like they're doing in the Amazon. So really the only way that we can switch to primarily a pasture-based system would be to drastically decrease the amount of meat that we're eating. Now there's, um, in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of studies of this, and there's now really a scientific consensus that we truly cannot keep climate change within survivable levels without changing our food system. Um, so the World Resources Institute uh, released a report that found that without changing diets, agriculture alone could produce enough emissions to surpass one and a half degrees of global warming. So basically, even if we took every other industry to net zero carbon emissions, so energy, transportation, buildings, completely carbon neutral by 2050, but we leave the food system to continue on its current trajectory, 
the food system alone will cause us to fail to meet the Paris Climate Accord. So this is a key part of the solution, any way that you cut it. Okay, so that's been all the bad news, um, but now I wanna get into the good news. Um, the first piece of good news is that food is a really potent climate solution and plant-based foods are um, a really easy way to cut the carbon footprint of your food. So um, the greenhouse gas emissions of plant-based meals are on average 63% lower than those of animal-based meals. And that's, you know, so that means that we as individuals have a lot of power. And then if you translate that to institutional change, it is an even bigger impact. So um, this study looked at the effectiveness of sustainability interventions that are done um, in universities and at businesses um, for events. And they found that the most effective intervention is switching from hamburger, from beef hamburgers to veggie burgers. Second to that is reducing the portion size of beef by 25%. Other interventions that we commonly think of, like using recycled plastic or eliminating single-use plastic altogether, you know, of course they're really important um, for other reasons. Plastic waste is, is a huge issue, but from a climate perspective, um, really it, the impact is pretty nil. Um, changing what food is served is much more impactful than changing how products are served. The other good news is that the plant-based movement has exploded in the last few years. So the CEO of Starbucks said it's the most dominant shift in consumer behavior that he's seen as the shift to plant-based. Um, plant-based menu items have increased over 800% over the last four years. So more than half of all households are now buying plant-based foods. And a quarter of Americans have recently reduced their meat consumption, um, including a third of all Americans of color. So who is driving this trend? It is mostly young people and omnivores. So the vast majority of all millennials and Gen Zers are already eating plant-based foods one to two times a week, and most of them wanna eat plant-based foods even more often. And then interestingly, um, almost half of households that buy plant-based milks also buy plant-based milks, and almost all consumers who buy plant-based meats also buy animal-based meats. So this is actually great news in a way because you know getting people to go 100% vegan is a big step um, and it's overwhelming to a lot of people, but eating more plant-based foods more often seems very doable. Um, this trend of what we call flexitarianism or reducitarian. So omnivores who are eating plant-based foods more often. So that's really what we as an organization focus on. Um, as this program focuses on is encouraging flexitarianism. So getting omnivores to eat more plant-based foods more often. And that's how we can most quickly transform our food system. We're not asking everyone to go, you know, cold turkey, as they say, overnight, but just to make this small change. And when all of us do it together on a large scale, it has a tremendous impact. So our work is also really influenced by behavioral economics, specifically the book Nudge by Nobel Prize laureate Richard Thaler and Harvard professor Cass Sunstein. Um, it explores the impacts of defaults and nudges on human behavior. Defaults are the option that people end up with if they don't make an active choice. So for instance, uh, ringtones. Most of us probably still have the default ringtone that our phone came with because we never bothered to go into the menu and change it. This book talks about how people have a really strong tendency to go along with the status quo or the default option. Part of the reason for that is that it's easier. It's just one less decision for our already overtaxed minds to make. And part of the reason is that it's seen as the norm. So we're social creatures. We like to fit in. We don't like to stand out or seem weird or go against the grain. And so one of the surest ways to make sure that we're doing what's normal and what everyone else is doing is to stick with that default. So by changing the defaults, you can really change people's behavior in pretty dramatic ways. One of the classic examples of this is organ donation. So in Germany, people by default are not organ donors and they have to opt into it. There, the participation rate is just 12%. In Austria, which is pretty culturally similar to Germany, people by default are organ donors and have to opt out of it. And there, the participation rate is 99%. So it's a drastic change just based on the default. And this actually has life-saving consequences um, when you increase the number of organ donors. To give an example that is more rooted in sustainability, this study looked at energy defaults. So in the control in year one, these businesses by default um, were opted into conventional energy um, and they could opt out into renewable energy. And you can see that all the businesses um, use conventional energy. So then for the, the experiment, they flipped the default. 
Um, so they made renewable energy the default and they gave people the choice to opt out into conventional energy. And when they did this, you can see there's a huge increase in the number of businesses that stick with that renewable default. So about 70% of businesses um, stuck with a renewable energy that had been using conventional energy before. And you can see that this is consistent over time. So it's not like that first year they didn't look at their bill, they didn't pay attention. And then as soon as they noticed, they switched back, but they're happy to stick with renewable when it is the default. So when you put these two things together, plant-based foods and defaults, you get greener by default. The core concept is really simple. Um, we're just looking to flip the norm. So, you know, right now, basically everywhere meat is the default. You have to especially opt in to plant-based foods. We're looking to make plant-based the default, give people the choice to opt into meat and dairy. So, you know, everyone still retains their freedom of choice. Nothing is taken off the menu. People who really want meat will have it there for them. Um, but it is no longer the default. So we're, we're establishing that these more low impact sustainable foods should be the norm. Um, but if you want meat, it is still there for you. This is really flexible. So there's different strategies to implement it in different food environments and it's cost neutral and can even potentially save money. It's also more inclusive. And this is something that really doesn't get talked about as much. Um, but you know, having meat and dairy as a default is um, exclusionary to a lot of people. Um, and it, it can be really alienating to not be able to take it for granted that you can sit down with your friends or your coworkers and just enjoy a meal, not knowing if you have to request special accommodations or even not be able to eat um, really, you know, creates a feeling of, of setting you apart. So serving plant-based foods that meet the needs of those with more specific diets with the option to add meat and dairy for those who want it includes everyone by default. This includes 30 to 50 million Americans who are lactose intolerant, uh, the majority of whom are people of color. It includes the many religions that encourage vegetarianism, so Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, um, Jainism, Seventh-day Adventism, Rastafarianism, um, as well as those that restrict certain animal products um, like Islam and Judaism. It includes those um, young people who, as we said, are eating a lot more plant-based foods and communities of color that, again, are also more likely to be reducing their meat consumption. And actually black Americans are twice as likely to be vegan as white Americans. So plant-based foods are really the lowest common denominator um, and the way to be most inclusive. This is also a really effective intervention. So this study that was done at the Harvard Kennedy School um, looked at a conference and in the control condition, um, like pretty much all conferences, meat was the default and then you could check a box to request a vegetarian option. And so they found um, that a quarter of people actually requested that vegetarian option, which is a lot higher than we would expect with the general public. Um, but still, you know, three quarters of people stuck with that meat default. Then for the experiment, they switched it. So they made vegetarian the default and they gave people a box to check to request meat. And in this, um, when veg was the default, they found two thirds of people stuck with that vegetarian default, a third opted into meat. So that was a 43% increase and the amount of veg meal served. A study in Denmark found even more dramatic results. So this was done across several different conferences, very similar study design. So um, in the control, meat was the default, people could request veg. Only 2% of people requested veg meals um, in this first study. And then they made veg the default and gave people the choice to request meat. And 87% of people stuck with that veg default, 13% requested meat. And they repeated this across several different conferences and found very similar results. So this is on average an 80% increase in the amount of veg meal served as a result of making it the default. So this also has huge impacts, um, especially when it's implemented by larger institutions. So um, we crunch the, crunch the numbers and um, a school or a business with um, a thousand employees or a thousand students that are that's serving lunch every day over the course of a year, um, if they're serving plant-based meals by default, they can save 9 million gallons of water. And again, cost neutral or cost savings. In comparison, installing low flow toilets for that many people would save only 600,000 gallons of water with an upfront cost of $15,000. Similarly, um, plant-based defaults can save 350,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent, cost neutral or cost savings, whereas installing a 240 kilowatt solar array um, would save about 275,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent with an upfront cost of about $360,000. So, you know, of course, not saying that it's not worth doing these infrastructure investments, but also um, food is a, another really easy way um, to help companies meet their sustainability goals. 
So how does this work in different food service settings? I'll talk about different strategies. So, you know, the core idea is to make plant-based the default. Um, make the, and one of the ways to do this is to make the base of the meal plant-based. Um, so you can serve plant-based with the option to opt into meat and dairy. Um, for buffets and family style meals, you can offer um, you know, plant-based entrees with meat and dairy as add-ons at the end of the line. So it's there for people who want it, but they won't be filling up their plates with it. If people are RSVPing for a meal, you can state that the food will be plant-based by default and then give a box to check if guests want to opt into meat, like those studies that I mentioned. Um, this is really great model for conferences in particular. Um, and then for restaurants, uh, meat and dairy can be offered as add-ons. You know, we're already used to this in certain settings, like um, if you're ordering a salad or a bowl, then um, you have to pay extra to add chicken. If it's not possible to make the entrees, um, the base of the entrees plant-based, uh, sorry, now my cat is joining me, <laughs> um, you can offer a minimum two to one ratio of plant-based to animal-based options, and that creates the perception that plant-based is the default. There's a study that was done at the University of Cambridge that found that increasing the ratio of veg to meat options from one to three to two to two increased the take rate of veg options by 60%. Part of the reason for this is that, you know, when there's just one veg option, it's seen as being for vegetarians. Omnivores perceive it as, oh, that's the vegetarian option or, oh, that's the vegan option. That's for the vegans. I'm not vegan. It's not for me. But really, our whole goal is to encourage omnivores to eat more plant-based options more of the time. So that it's not seen as an identity of, you know, either I am this thing or I'm not, but rather, you know, all of us should be eating more plant-based foods more often, um, regardless of how we identify. So when there's just a plethora of delicious sounding items in front of you, you know, maybe there's a pasta and a risotto and a salad, then you're choosing based on the flavors and what you're in the mood for, rather than whether or not something is vegetarian. Another great strategy is subtle substitutions. So serving plant-based condiments, milks, desserts, and breads by default. Again, as we discussed, this is more inclusive because it meets the needs of people with allergies and dietary restrictions and people who are vegan. Um, and products are really so good nowadays that people don't even notice the difference. So we work with UCLA and um, their dining was testing out a vegan brownie and they did taste tests and they found that people actually in blind taste tests preferred the vegan brownie to the non-vegan one. Um, they thought it tasted better. And so, you know, it's, it's easier for them because they don't have to worry about students, again, with egg allergies or lactose intolerance or who are vegan. Everyone can eat it. People prefer the taste. It has a smaller carbon water footprint. And it's actually cheaper for them to make because it doesn't require eggs. So really, it's a win-win. And this is a strategy that um, you can use, you know, both in institutions, but also as an individual, you know, hopefully post-COVID. And for the holidays, if we're cooking meals for other people, if you're going to a potluck, consider trying a, a vegan, a plant-based recipe. You know, even if you're not 100% vegan yourself, this is still a really easy way to cut the footprint, um, try out some new fun recipes. And, you know, you can, I like to look and see the, the reviews. A lot of the times with vegan recipes, you get omnivores who are saying, you know, I, I was shocked at how good this is, or I served this to my family and no one had any idea it was vegan. So, you know, a fun way to kind of dip your toe in. And then if there's a set menu um, for an event or that's being displayed, um, incorporating plant-based options into the main menu and listing them first um, actually increases the selection of plant-based items by 56%. And again, you know, when the vegetarian or vegan options are kind of segregated into their own menu, omnivores don't even look at it because you think, oh, that's for the vegetarians, it's not for me. And then finally, um, using mouthwatering labels. So labeling foods with names that are really focused on taste, texture, and provenance, so where they're from, where the flavors are based, rather than advertising it as vegetarian, vegan, meatless, or healthy, low fat, again, really increases the take rate among omnivores. So, you know, on the right, we have this beautiful chocolate cake, and a lot of people probably wouldn't choose it because it's labeled as decadent vegan chocolate. And to some people, that sounds like an oxymoron. How could it be decadent and vegan? So people would be more likely to try it if it's just called decadent chocolate cake. World Resources Institute did a study in the UK, and they found that meat-free sausages and mash, changing the name of that dish to Cumberland Spice Veggie Sausages and Mash, increased sales by 76%. Um, so, you know, focusing on the flavors rather than on the fact that it's vegan makes people much more likely to choose it. So that's um, the basic gist. Um, you know, this, these strategies can be implemented in any food setting. So we, I work primarily with businesses. Um, it can be used for businesses that cater meetings, even if that's just occasionally 
once a week or once a month, you can still implement this as a policy, can work for snacks and micro kitchens and cafes, um, of course, for cafeterias. We also work with universities and organizations. We have, we're making an effort to get environmental NGOs to implement this as a food policy um, in order to kind of walk the walk. And we also consult with conferences and restaurants and cafes. Um, we're doing another study right now in a big uh, campaign next year to get cafes to make oat milk the default milk uh, rather than cow milk. And actually that's, that's really a growing trend among cafes. That's very exciting. And so we um, try to make it as easy as possible for all institutions and organizations to implement these strategies and everything um, we offer is completely free of charge. We're a nonprofit, just you know, trying, to, trying to make plant-based the default in the world. All right, so I will end there to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, this is our website and my email address. I would love to hear from you. And also uh, after I did the climate reality training a few years ago, I worked with another group of climate reality leaders to make some optional slides specifically on animal agriculture that can be added into the slide deck. So if you were interested in those, um, please send me an email and I can share those with you. All right, so I will stop sharing my screen and would love to take questions. So. Um, I will take a look at the chat first, and then um, once we get through those, then you can raise your hand and ask a question. Um, so someone asked about the relative nutrition of cow milk versus soy or oat milk. Um, you know, it depends on the milk that you, the particular milk that you buy. Most plant-based milks um, are fortified with calcium, so they have as much or more calcium as cow milk. Um, they don't have any saturated fat or cholesterol. Um, and soy milk has protein in it naturally. Some oat milks are also fortified with protein. Um, there are some pea-based pea milk, P-E-A, um, <laughs> like that have a lot of protein in them, sometimes more than cow milk. So it depends a lot on the specific brand that you're buying. Um, also, some of them are sweetened, so they have more sugar. Some are unsweetened. Um, so there's really a lot of variation, but um, generally speaking, most of the main ones are relatively similar nutritional profile. Um, okay, good question. What is a methane digester? So um, it's basically a, um, a machine that like uh, takes in the methane. Um, so rather than just having the, the methane go out into the air, it, it gathers it. And then I actually have no idea how they work. If anyone knows the science behind them, maybe they can share, but um, it basically converts that, that methane into energy. Uh, I, I actually have written a couple papers about them. Fantastic. So um, if you think of like uh, an Instapot where it's like airtight, so anaerobic, um, it captures the methane. Are you talking about food waste, for example? It captures the methane and then it um, they either purify it or they can use it to heat. They can use it to heat and power the facility where they're um, capturing the gas, like a dairy farm. Um, they're often on dairy farms. And then what they do is they use it as um, either electricity, they can turn it into electricity to power vehicles, or they can um, use it as renewable natural gas to replace natural gas as a renewable energy source. And then they have um, digestate, which is like a, can be used as an organic fertilizer. So it's a carbon negative um, energy. So it's Fantastic. thank you for sharing that. Great. Um, so Leanne had asked a question about um, a federal carbon tax reducing or eliminating big ag carbon credits or whether it would exacerbate it. Um, unfortunately, it seems almost guaranteed to exacerbate it. Um, Tom Vilsack is very much a friend of big ag. Um, and yeah, like they've kind of, I know, <laughs> I know it's very sad. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, with their policy on methane, they're pretty clearly indicating that they want um, methane digesters and subsidies for big ag to, to implement those to be like a cornerstone of their policy. So yeah, I, I suspect that a federal um, carbon credit would just further monetize factory farming, but I hope not. And I also hope, you know, there hasn't been as much focus on that. I don't know if it's a little bit too wonky. Um, a lot of the bigger environmental groups are just starting to speak out against them, partly because of the environmental justice issue that it does create so much pollution for local communities, um, but also because it is really further entrenching factory farming, but it's just not, it hasn't gotten enough um, attention, I think, like not enough groups are really mobilizing around it. So I think we really need to fight harder. Um, 
Okay, so there's a question from Belinda. Um, where would you start in trying to get a high school to make the transition? So, um, you know, high schools are really, it's obviously really important and it's amazing. There's so many young people who are really mobilizing around um, the climate. Um, and I know there's a lot of high school students here tonight. Um, so really appreciate you being here. Um, the hard thing about high schools is if it's a public school, then the food decisions are made on the district level. And so, um, you know, if it's a charter school or a private school, then it's easier for students to directly affect the food that's being served in their cafeteria. Um, and so in that case, um, I mean, really generally speaking, anywhere that we work, like the steps are first, like kind of finding allies to rally around your cause. So find other students who are passionate about this bring in speakers or give talks yourself, make posters, kind of raise awareness about this, get other people to understand why this is really important, um, why it's exciting, why this is a way that we can like take power into our own hands, um, and then figure out who are the decision makers. So, you know, if it's a private school, there's, I'm sure there's a, you know, a, like a cafeteria manager, dining director, there may be a nutritionist, and then you know, perhaps the principal has say over them, you have to kind of ask around. Um, we do this in corporations a lot, uh, as Leanne knows, it's often very hard to figure out like who actually can make that decision, can make that call. So we do a lot of asking around to different different departments. Um, but yeah, and then, um, then talk with them, meet with them, tell them what you want and figure out how you can work together to help them do that. Um, you know, if you are part of a public school, then you have to do that work on the district level, um, which is harder. Um, it can be done. It can definitely be done, but it does require um, a pretty long-term commitment. As Amy Hall, <laughs> who's here, well knows, uh, Amy and I worked together for a couple of years in Portland trying to get um, Portland public schools to just serve a vegan um, hot meal option one day a week. That was all that we were asking, and we still have not succeeded at that. Um, yeah, so Amy is valiantly still trying. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I think again, and especially at the district level, really having a good community of people who are working on it with you to kind of keep up the fight and just being prepared to be in it for the long haul and not getting discouraged if you if you can't, um, can't get it in a place right away. Um, but yeah, also reach out. Um, I know Leanne put my email address on the chat. But yeah, we I mean, you know, we love to support people. We do work mostly with corporations and universities, um, but we can offer resources for high school students too. So if anyone else has a question, you can either just type it in the chat or raise your hand. Oh, Steve, Steve has a hand up. Yeah, yeah. yeah first, fantastic presentation. And I just love you. your uh, idea of by default, the nudge principle, because it really sidesteps the culture war about beef being important to the American way and all that stuff. I mean, you're just giving options and it really appeals to the more uh, libertarian and conservative elements that want options. So I just think that's brilliant. Uh, my personal question comes from, uh, I notice I have a greater willingness to give up meat than dairy. And I'm wondering what does the science say about the relative harm slash benefit of going meatless versus completely dairy free, that is uh, cheese and milk and so forth. How big of a deal is dairy in the mix of climate change? Yeah, good question. So um, first of all, you know, I would say that just start where you can. I think, you know, it's, it's easy to let perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, but a lot of people are dismayed to know that cheese has the second highest carbon footprint of any product. Um, so, you know, dairy comes from cows and cows emit methane and nitrous oxide. And so similarly to beef, um, dairy does have a larger carbon footprint. Um, cheese has a particularly large carbon footprint because it takes so much milk to make cheese and same thing with butter. Um, and that's also the reason that it's water intensive. But yeah, if you look at a chart like cheese and butter here and then the actual dairy milk is down here. So um, cheese, very carbon intensive, dairy milk, not as carbon intensive, um, but, yeah, you know, I, I think just starting with certain products, I know that cheese is also very addictive. It's actually like chemically addictive. They found um, casein is, is addictive. So it's really hard to give up. Um, but, you know, well, there's. I, yeah, but I mean, I, I appreciate the do what you can one step at a time. But uh, just, you know, if, if we look at uh, what the whole industry contributes at 100% and we do a pie chart, roughly what percentage of dairy 
cheese and milk production would be a part of that 100%? Like 20%? Like, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I don't, I haven't seen it broken down that way. I mean, you see it broken down as like animal agriculture is a percentage of greenhouse gas emissions. And then you see like the individual emissions of each type of food. I've never seen dairy as a percentage of the agriculture emissions, but, um, but also you can't really parse it out because dairy cows become hamburger meat. Um, dairy cows are often beef cows. So it's, it's actually one in the same industry, which I think is part of the reason that you don't see it separated out like that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Katie. I have a question. Um, I joined a little late. I'm sorry. I had some other programming before yeah. this. I was just about to go to the gym, but I wanted to catch this really quickly. Um, how do you advocate for arguing a plant-based diet towards athletes? Because I know that when they start eating a lot of plant-based um, protein sources, it's a little too much fiber, and then that causes some you know, IBS and stomach issues. So I was just curious what you have to say about this. Yeah, so I think uh, the movie Game Changers is definitely the best resource for athletes out there. Um, it's a phenomenal movie. Um, it's also very fact-based. Um, they really like paid close attention to the science and made sure that they, what they're saying is really legitimate. Um, also, yeah, just for guys out there who are like, you know, there's some weird like gender stereotypes about eating more plant-based foods and real men eat meat and all that kind of thing. So I think for athletes, for for kind of more macho men who are interested in this, um, Game Changers is a fantastic resource. Um, and you know what you mentioned with with eating more fiber. I mean, that's an issue for anyone. Um, you know, if if people are eating a lot of fast food, a lot of processed food, a lot of meat, and then they start eating a lot of like beans and kale and veggies. Um, you know, we have a, a microbiome, like a bacteria in our gut, and different types of food feed different bacteria. And so there's like a whole different microbiome that eats meat and cheese then eats plant-based protein. And so if your gut is used to digesting a bunch of meat and dairy, and then suddenly you feed it a bunch of kale, you don't have the right bacteria. They're like, whoa, I can't deal with this. And so yeah, people get bloated, they get crampy, they don't feel good, um, which is why, you know, I recommend a lot of people recommend kind of slowly transitioning and not like trying to overhaul your diet overnight, but just slowly and gradually introducing more plant-based proteins, more veggies, to kind of slowly transition your, your gut and your microbiome to be able to more comfortably digest this, uh, the higher fiber diet. Thank you. I will definitely check out that video. I've been meaning to watch it. Um, and also I, I did see the latter part of your presentation and I wanted to say thank you. It was very informative. I learned yeah, a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Katrine? Hi. Um, so I work, um, at a grocery store, uh, it's a natural grocery store. So we're already, you know, trying our best to kind of help out with the sustainability effort. Um, and, you know, we have a kind of a kitchen slash deli as part of it. Um, and we have lots of plant-based options, I think, but it definitely isn't like you were saying, like the default. Um, and so does your, is it an organization or I don't know. Um, does it offer maybe like presentation resources as well? Because I would love to uh, connect some of our managers uh, to you guys and try and kind of step up our game a little bit. And I think that they would be really open to it. Yeah, I would love to work with you on that. That's exactly the kind of thing that we do. So yeah, if you want to just um, message me your email address, I'd, I'd love to follow up with you on that. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. The presentation was really great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and just, you know, uh, we that is really like what we do and what I love to do and what our, my the whole purpose of my job is. So if any of you are interested in bringing plant-based defaults to your workplace, um, to your university, potentially to your high school, um, please let me know. You can, you can just like message me your email address in the chat um, or you can follow up with me. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat again, but yeah, I would love to work with you on this. Any final questions? Well, excellent. So if anybody thinks of any other questions, Katie has said she can stay a few minutes after. We're gonna go ahead and officially kind of wrap up. We wanna uh, try to keep within our hour constraint. So let's all give Katie a massive round of applause for her incredible presentation. So uh, 
motivating and just informational. So um, thank you uh, for joining us this evening. I do have just a, a few announcements. Uh, first, a couple of announcements on the sustainable food front. Um, Leanne, our treasurer who helped organize this e event this evening, is actually trying to pull together a um, vegetarian cookbook or vegan plant-based cookbook and is welcoming any contributions in the way your favorite delicious recipes. So uh, I think Leanne's going to put a link in the chat uh, for where you can send those and uh, we are excited about seeing that project come together. Another food related thing announcement is that this Sunday 4 p.m. Uh, the Palo Alto based climate organization Actera is bringing together a diverse slate of chefs from across the Bay Area for an event they call Holiday Refresh 2021. They're going to showcase their favorite plant based recipes for holidays with live cooking demonstrations and they will also be using all electric induction cooktops to cook it. So it'll be a fun way to gain some inspiration for climate friendly uh, diet choices and cooking techniques. And I will uh, plunk a, a link to register for that in uh, the chat in a moment. Uh, then also we do just have a few chapter events coming up as well. On Sunday, 1 p.m., our climate justice team is hosting a COP26 watch party. Uh, it's a great kind of informal opportunity to get together with other people and talk about what's happening at the COP. Um, November 17th, later this month, 6 p.m., our policy action team will be hosting a panel where they will discuss all electric buildings and kind of this new frontier of pivoting our focus to upgrade uh, existing buildings that all important retrofit question. Uh, then we'll take a break for Thanksgiving and come back December 8th. Uh, our, our own Gary White uh, will be in conversation with the Climate Center's Ellie Cohen, a really um, outstanding climate leader here in the Bay Area. So join us for any or of all of those. All of our events are open for registration on our website. They are all free. And Carolyn, I'm hoping, will be able to put a link to our events page in the chat so you can find those and learn more about them and register. I uh, also encourage you to check out our events page uh, to see our past events. We have recordings of all of our past events on the events page and it's a great opportunity to kind of see these incredible speakers like Katie uh, that we have throughout the year on a diverse array of uh, topics. I'll also mention for the chapter members that are here, elections for the 2022 chapter leadership team will be coming up in January. So if you're thinking about it, you might be interested, you have some ideas, uh, get in touch with us. I will put our email address in the chat and whenever I'm finished with this announcement. Uh, last little announcement, just encourage people that haven't checked it out already to try the Climate Action Now app. Um, it makes it super easy to take climate action. I believe Actera has embraced it as has uh, Climate Reality Bay Area chapter. You can take action in seconds or minutes, uh, contact influencers and whatever. So it's a, a great tool to use. Um, that's another link I'll put in the chat. Uh, so check out our website, engage in our programs, join us again, join or start a team here at the Climate Reality Bay Area chapter. We really appreciate all of you coming and joining us this evening. Thank you, Leanne and Wei Tai for organizing, Wei Tai Kwok for organizing this event this evening. Thank you so much, Katie, for the fabulous presentation. And thank you, Carolyn, for running the Zoom as expertly as you always do. And thank all of you for joining us. And that officially brings us to a close. Uh, and like I say, we will uh, hang on here if there are additional questions and answers. And I'll put some of those links in the chat now. Thank you, Harriet. And I also wanted to give a shout out and thank Wei Tai not only for helping organize this event tonight, but for also being on the advisory board of Greener by Default. So Wei Tai helped a lot with designing our materials and strategy. Round of applause. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>